well, we are a little bit outnumbered uh, to the number I have expected to come, but as we know, we have colloquia today on anatomy. Uh, it is an honor and pleasure to present you Professor Peres Mendelssohn. Actually, I didn't know him uh, until yesterday. No. <laughs> yesterday we met at the airport. Uh, I know him by person, I didn't know him by person, and I just have received his mail right at the moment I wrote him one. So he was very efficient. I was really astonished. And uh, also, we had pleasure and honor also to send our assistant, Georgi Jorovic, to his laboratory, to the laboratory of Professor Svensson, to do his PhD thesis. So we have a good collaboration with his laboratory, which is very famous. I don't want to mention his Hirschinix, neither in number of other citations, don't worry, because the number is very, very impressive, but you can find it on the internet as well. I'm going to speak a little bit about the things uh, that couldn't be so easily, but yes, could be found on the internet, but not so easily. Professor Peres Wendingsen and his collaborates are doing uh, very prominent researches about uh, about 5th uh, HD uh, 1B receptors, especially protein P11, which is uh, which is uh, which is also which is common for uh, persons uh, suffering from depression, but also Parkinson's disease. So, uh, together with all the other investigations, we shall hear some results of his team and his own today and think, it is, I think really, that is, it is going to, pre to be one very, very inspiring lecture and it is going to be an inspiration for all of us to inspire us to prolong our investigation and also to prolong the collaboration between our two laboratories. So once again, thank you for coming. My apologies for such a small number of listeners but even Jesus has started with only 12 followers. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you can see uh, where he is now, uh, hopefully you're not, you're not going to be crucified anyway. <laughs> but, uh, well, yes, uh, he started with a small number of followers, but this number was growing and growing through the period. I think also that is going to be your case. And I really want to beg you and ask you to come to our celebration of 100 years and also to be part of it together with the, all the other visiting professors. I want to, I want to con congratulate you to, for the election of the visiting, for the visiting professor on our university and graduate faculty, medical faculty as well. And hopefully you're going to be one of the lecturers at our course of neurosciences in future. Thank you, Professor Svenningsen, and I really do hope that this, this collaboration is going to last. Thank you, Vasily. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so now everything officially is in place, and uh, indeed uh, we are looking forward uh, to host you uh, mm -hmm. very soon the next time, the mm -hmm. second time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, our recognition of your uh, all achievements, and our we are really delighted uh, to have you with mm -hmm. us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Thank you very much for, for all those kind words. Uh, uh, I'm very uh, honored to be here today, and uh, I've been extremely well hosted by Professor Filopovic, and, and uh, of course uh, I know um, George Jurovic since some years now, when you have been coming to our laboratory at Karolinska Institute, and really produced a lot of very exciting results that I hope we can publish in a very distinguished journal in the quite near future. And uh, you will also come back to the lab uh, later this year. And I also encourage all others that have interest in, uh, in coming to Karolinska Institute to talk to George or me, and, and I'm sure we can arrange uh, for a collaboration and a visit for you. Um, so I will give a talk about work that I've been doing over the years, and um, there will be two uh, different uh, parts. Um, 
The first part will be about a protein called P11 and its role in um, depression and uh, Parkinsonism. Then I've added a little bit shorter part about uh, another new uh, target that we work on for Parkinson's disease called DPR37. Um, but if we start then with um, P11, so P11 is a protein that is important in modulating uh, serotonin uh, neurotransmission. And as you know, uh, the serotonin system is uh, quite uh, complex with uh, 14 different receptors, uh, some being located on the serotonin neurons themselves, like the 5 h one a receptor that dictates the firing of the serotonin neurons, and the 5 h one b that I will focus on, that is the autoreceptor for the serotonin system, regulating the neurotransmitter release from the, the serotonin release from the serotonin neurons. Then, uh, 5 h one a 5 h one b but a lot of other serotonin receptors are also located on non-serotonergic neurons, and they are grouped based on how they regulate signal transduction. So we have the 5 h one group that are GI-coupled, the 5 h two group that is GQ-coupled, the 5 h three receptor that is an, actually an uh, ion uh, channel, 5 h four 6, and 7 that is GS-coupled, the 5 h five receptor that is probably a GI-coupled receptor, but at the time when this slide was done, it was not known. But I, so the, the serotonin system is, as we know, very, very important, and we come back to that in terms of depression, but it's also very important in, uh, for example, I mean, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorders, but also in disorders such as uh, migraine and uh, many different conditions. But again, it is um, many receptors and it's quite complex. And the complexity is actually even uh, higher when you start to look at uh, adapter protein to the receptors. So during my talk, I will focus on an adapter protein for the 5 h one b receptor, P11. And here it's a summary slide from a review that Klaus-Peter Lesch uh, wrote in Neuron, where he indicated uh, various uh, important mechanisms whereby the serotonin system uh, modulates uh, the glutamate system and synaptic plasticity. And he, he indicated this P11 protein as being an important uh, uh, protein in these type of interactions and mechanisms. So I uh, discovered this P11 uh, when, when I was interested uh, in understanding how uh, serotonin receptors are trafficked in the cells and also how they are signaling uh, in the cells. So what I did is something called GIST to hybrid where you try to find partners that bind uh, to receptors. In this case, it was the third intracellular loop of the 5 h one b and then also the 5 h 4 receptor. So I found an interaction between P11 and the 5 h one b receptor that I could confirm with co-immunoprecipitation and then also with uh, GSD pull-down uh, experiments. At the time when I made uh, this finding, not much was known about P11. Uh, but we were a little bit lucky in that P11 is uh, quite abundant in some cell lines, such as uh, HeLa cells. And when I stained uh, HeLa cells for P11, it turned out that P11 is very, as you can see here, enriched at the cell surface. So, uh, and then uh, when we co-expressed 5 h one b receptors in these HeLa cells, we found a very nice match. Um, between the expression of P11 and 5 h one b receptors in the, in the cell surface. But there are also other cell lines that do not natively express P11, such as uh, cost cells. So we used cost cells that don't have any P11, but put P11, overexpressed P11 in these cells, and studied how it affected them, a serotonin receptor levels at the cell surface, and also signaling via these 5 h one b receptors. And it turned out in this biotinylation experiment that P11 increases the surface expression of, of 5 h one b receptors um, at, the, at, at the cell membrane at the surface levels. And also in a functional assay, we found that uh, P11 potentiates the effects of serotonin. So in these experiments, we had to stimulate first uh, the cells with forskolin. Uh, since the 5 h one b, b receptor reduces uh, cyclic AMP, which was the uh, effect that we measured in these experiments. And we found that in the presence of P11, this uh, serotonin 5 h one b mediated reduction of cyclic AMP was enhanced. 
So P11 increases 5-H21B and also we know also 5-H4 receptors at the cell surface and uh, increases there by the signaling via the serotonin system. Uh, we then st started to study, since I've always been interested in neuroscience and uh, neuropharmacology and, and uh, also to some extent histology, we studied the expression of P11 uh, in the brain. Uh, by in situ hybridization, and it turned out that P11 is quite widespread, as you can see in the brain in the sagittal section from a mouse brain, with some enrichment in prefrontal cortex and also in some nuclei in the, in the brain stem. When we did uh, in situ hybridization of consecutive sections between uh, P11 and 5 h one b receptors, we found a very nice match uh, in uh, prefrontal cortex, in, in hypothalamus in the CA1 region of hippocampus, but also in the serotonin neurons in the raffin nuclei. It's not uh, a complete overlap between P11 and 5 h one b receptors, but there is several important regions for uh, emotionality where there is a nice co-localization between P11 and 5 h one b receptors. More recently, I have also been part of a study by a, a Serbian uh, colleague in New York, Anna Milosevic, uh, who did a more detailed mapping of P11 in the brain, uh, looking at the protein levels. And uh, as you can see here, <coughs> she found P11 in several different parts of, of cortex, in hippocampus, ubiculum, different uh, regions of amygdala. Uh, again, the serotonin neurons in the raffe, dorsal raffe uh, region, and also a lot of, there is a lot of P11 in the neuroadrenergic neurons in the locus ceruleus. So, uh, P11 is um, highly expressed in brain circuitries that regulates emotionality. I mentioned prefrontal cortex, uh, hippocampus, amygdala, and, and the uh, raffe nuclei. So, based on this uh, localization of P11, uh, when we found uh, the protein, uh, we started to study how uh, P11 may modulate the aspects of uh, emotionality and treated animals with various uh, psychoactive compounds. And it turned out that especially antidepressants are very uh, potent in inducing P11. So for example, the classical tricyclic antidepressant imipramine increases P11 very strongly in prefrontal cortex, but also in uh, hippocampus. Another treatment that increases P11 potently is ECT, uh, electroconvulsive therapy. And I should say that this is not by a single treatment. You need repeated treatments to get this induction of, of uh, P11. So it's not an immediate early gene. It's a gene that has some resemblance with a, a protein called delta 4 b that has been studied quite a lot also in this type of um, context when it comes to psychoactive compounds, not least by Eric Nestler. Uh, so, we found that P11 is dynamically regulated, especially by different antidepressants, but then we wanted to also study whether P11 is changed in models of depression, and um, as uh, Professor Filopovic knows, and, and several of you in the audience knows, there is no standard model for, for depression. We often try to use different stress paradigms uh, and so on, uh, and we have to some extent done that. But at the time when I found this P11 gene, there was a paper by a French group uh, uh, from Rouen uh, that uh, studied what they called the helpless mice. Uh, so they used uh, the tail suspension test, which is a very common test to screen for antidepressant compounds. And uh, so, so it's a test, it's very simple to do. You hang basically the mice by the tail and you give um, and the, the mice, I mean, dislike that, and they start to struggle and, and, uh, and move. But after a while, they, they stop moving. They get helpless in a helpless state, and they just hang immobile by their tail. But, but then if you give antidepressant compounds, they struggle for a much longer time. Uh, and this, we know, has nothing to do with pure locomotion. It's something inherent to, to many antidepressant compounds, not least the uh, monoamine-based antidepressant compounds. But anyway, what uh, 
Eh, Jean-Marie Bourgeois and Elika eh, Jacobi did was that they took mice and they tested them for this taste suspension test and divided them so they started to breed the mice that I mean were in, very mobile with each other and the ones that were then more active with each other so they got these two different strains the helpless, helpless and the non-helpless mice and uh, they characterized these mice very nice in terms of uh, uh, stress uh, reactivity in terms of sleep pattern and uh, also in terms of anxiety and uh, I was impressed of that paper and contacted them and asked them whether they could send some brains to me, uh, brain samples and to measure uh, this P11 gene then in this depression model and they did that and then I did this in situ hybridization again uh, on uh, helpless and non-helpless mice and the Results are quite spectacular. Uh, so as you can see, uh, the helpless mice, or depression-like mice, they have extremely reduced levels of uh, P11 in, in um, uh, stratum, in cortex, and uh, several other brain regions. It's not changed in all brain regions. You can see here some cholinergic uh, regions in the more ventral pallidum, or bed of stria terminalis and so on, where, where P11 is actually not changed in the helpless mice. But I also did study uh, these brains for a lot of other important uh, molecules when it comes to depression, such as BDNF and uh, also different serotonin receptors and so on, but nothing was changed as much as P11 is changed. So this really was a very interesting observation and uh, encourage us to think that this could be an important molecule in relation to serotonin transmission and uh, especially then depression. I'm trained as a medical doctor and uh, therefore I've always been interested to try to translate my work into to clinical uh, applications or clinical relevance at least. So when we had this finding uh, in the mouse, uh, I started to ask uh, brain banks for uh, human brain samples. And I got human brain samples from um, the Stanley Foundation in the United States. And I got uh, uh, samples from the single cortex. At the time, uh, it was a very interesting region. It's the region where uh, Helen Mayberg did DBS to, to treat uh, depression in, in um, some cases. Uh, so it's the area 25 of single cortex. And we found that P11 is reduced both at the mRNA level and at the protein level in, in this uh, uh, single cortex. I also got the tissue from uh, Carol Taming at UT Southwestern in Dallas from nucleus accumbens. And P11 is also, as you can see here, significantly reduced in nucleus accumbens from uh, in this post-mortem uh, uh, material at the protein level. Then uh, I generated mice that lack P11, knockout mice, and we started to study these mice, and I will share uh, some of the data. Like I said, uh, we found P11 as being a binding part to the 5 h one b receptor. So in the first experiments that we did in these mice was to study how P11 modulates actions via the 5 h one b receptor, and one uh, type of action that the 5 h one b receptor is known to regulate is the excitatory synaptic transmission from cortical regions to nucleus accumbens. Um, so serotonin via 5 h one b receptors have, reduces this uh, excitatory synaptic transmission. Uh, so the, and that's also what we found in the, in the wild type animals. But in the animals lacking uh, P11, the P11 knockout animals, we could no longer see this uh, serotonin mediated uh, reduction of excitatory synaptic transmission in, in slices from uh, uh, ventral stratum and nucleus accumbens. We also looked then in the same slice preparation on the phosphorylation state of a protein that is enriched at nerve terminals called synapsin. And we looked at synapsin at the phosphorylation site uh, serine 9 that is. Uh, phosphorylated by PKA. And as expected, we found that the 5 h one b agonist, Ampirtolin, reduced the phosphorylation of synapsin at, at this serine 9 uh, site. But again, this effect uh, of Ampirtolin was abolished in the P11 knockout animals. 
and we did some more work on, 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 on signaling and so on in these mice. Um, and it seems that P11 is important for many actions of 5 to one b receptors. We also did various behavioral tests, and we came back to this tail suspension test that they introduced before that Jean-Marie Vaucha and Elika Maliakoubi used in their helpless model. And we did the tail suspension test in the P11 knockout animals and the wild types. And the P11 knockout animals by themselves have a little bit of a depression-like phenotype. And perhaps more prominently, they respond less to a uh, treatment with uh, imipramine, the tricyclic antidepressant, and also to a 5 ht one b receptor agonist, ampirtolin, that has a known antidepressant effect in this test. So uh, the P11 mice per se are somewhat uh, depression-like and, and have a reduced response to, to uh, uh, tricyclic antidepressants. And the fact that we saw this um, increased depression-like behavior in uh, P11 knockout animals were then a few years later uh, recapitulated with another morphology. So we used the uh, focal um, RNAi to knock down P11 specifically in nucleus accumbens in mice. Uh, so we um, used AV-based vectors to overexpress either a control uh, uh, sequence or the RNAi against P11. And in these mice with um, uh, lowered levels of P11, specifically in nucleus accumbens, we again could see that the, the mice were uh, somewhat, uh, they showed an increased immobility in the taste suspension test indicating a depression-like phenotype. We have also done tests uh, with the chronic treatment of uh, antidepressants uh, such as floxetine or Prozac or an SSRIs. And uh, one test that is sensitive for chronic antidepressant monaim based uh, antidepressant uh, treatment is called novel suppressed feeding test. So it's a test where you, you um, uh, the day before the, treat, the test, you starve the animals, you take away the food. And then what you do on the morning after that, during the test day, is that you put the animal in an open uh, arena, uh, where you, in the middle uh, of the arena has put the food pellet, and, but you also put a lot of light on the center of the arena. So there is a, an uh, aversion for the uh, mice to, to uh, normally go and eat uh, this food pellet, but at the same time, it of course is very, very hungry, so it has that drive to, to, to start to eat. And we know that if you have given animals chronic treatment with floxetin, the duration, the latency to feed is strongly reduced. And that's what we found in the wild type animals, so that have been treated then with floxetin compared to the vehicle animals. And these animals had then been treated with floxetin for three weeks before the experiment. But this effect was also uh, virtually abolished in the P11 knockout animals. So it seems that P11 is important for uh, many effects of serotonin-based antidepressant uh, therapies. Then, uh, in order to understand more mechanism, uh, how P11 can uh, cause these um, antidepressant effects and be involved in, in, in this uh, type of um, cascades. There have been a, a, a very interesting study done uh, by John Kim and colleagues uh, in Paul Greengall lab. Uh, what they did is that they um, tried to find uh, additional P11 binding pr uh, proteins. So they did a pull-down experiment with uh, P11 from brain tissue and uh, detected then other proteins that uh, were bound to P11. And they found uh, one protein called annexin A2 or P36, which is a known interactor with P11. Actually, an alternative name for P11 is annexin A2 light chain. So this was a known interaction, which in a way is encouraging that you find what other people have uh, discovered before. But they also found some new interaction partners with P11. ANAC1, SPT6, and SMARCA3. ANAC1 and SMARCA3 shared a common sequence uh, that um, 
they then hypothesized could be a binding region uh, to uh, P11. And uh, what they then did in order to prove this uh, was quite spectacular experiments. So they found first, and that had been uh, shown before, that uh, P11 act exists as a heterotetrameric complex with uh, annexin A2. So, and they made then a crystal structure of this heterotetrameric complex between annexin A2 and P11. And in this heterotetrameric complex between annexin A2 and P11, this uh, peptide sequence corresponding to the putative binding reading for small C3 and ANAC1 fitted perfectly. So they could show uh, that um, uh, evidence then for that small CA3 binds uh, to the heterotetrameric P11 and XNA2 complex in, in this fashion. Now, uh, small CA3 is also quite new. So P11 is a new molecule to start with, but then small CA3, uh, at the time at least, was a, a quite um, new, new molecule with, or a molecule with, where we didn't know so much about. But what is known is that it's a chromatin remodeling factor. And uh, if um, uh, small cell 3 then has the capacity to bind to DNA and regulate gene transcription. And it turned out that um, P11 is necessary for uh, small cell 3 to bind to DNA as shown in this, this uh, slide. So in the absence of, of P11, you don't get any binding of small CA3 to DNA. So you need the heterotetrameric complex of an XNA2 and P11 for small CA3 to bind to DNA, but also to uh, cause uh, activation of transcription, in this case of PI1, the target gene then for small CA3. So the, act the activation of um, PI1 gene is gone in the absence of, of P11. Small CA3 is also uh, relatively highly abundant in the brain and co-localized with P11 in several different uh, neuronal subtypes. So there is a nice uh, co-localization between P11 and small CA3 in the in hippocampus, in, in um, uh, granule cells, also in uh, basket cells, these um, pyvalbumin-enriched cells in, in, in the hippocampus. You can see examples here how, how P11 and small CA3 are, are highly uh, co-localized at the protein level. So Yon Kim uh, made a knockout mice of uh, small CA3 and tested them again in this um, novel suppressed feeding test that I introduced to you before that is uh, sensitive to chronic treatment with uh, SSRI such as fluoxetine and uh, found, uh, like we found earlier in the P11, experiment that in the wild type situation, fluoxetine reduced the latency to feed in this test, but this effect was abolished in the, in the small CA3 mice, like we had found before in the P11 knockout mice. So some years ago, I mean, time is flying, it felt like it was yesterday, but I realize now it's seven years ago, uh, we summarized uh, the work at the time, what, what we had done on, on serotonin receptors P11 and an XNA2 and small CA3 in a review paper for Nature Neuroscience, and we came up with this summary cartoon where we believe that <coughs> SSRIs and also tricyclic antidepressants that elevate the levels of, of serotonin at the synapse stimulate serotonin receptors. Now we're focused on the 5 to one b receptor, but we also know that the 5 to 4 receptor is, is stimulated in a very similar fashion and also regulated very potently by P11. But anyway, here we just um, indicated the serotonin receptor. So serotonin stimulates serotonin receptors that increases the levels of P11. And then P11 serves as a positive feedback uh, mechanism and increases the levels of the serotonin receptors at the cell surface. So we get this positive feedback in the serotonin system. And at the same time, there is also inductions of annexin A2. Annexin A2 and P11 now forms this heterotetrameric complex that can bind to small CA3, go into the cell nucleus, and regulate gene transcription of various genes. And we know that by several steps uh, that this can influence behavior. And also, I haven't shown the data 
We also know that it can stimulate uh, uh, neurogenesis in the subventricular zone of um, uh, in the subgranular zone of, of um, hippocampus. I should say I don't have any slides on that here, uh, but there is now also publications and data that P11 is important in regulating the function of MGLUR5 glutamate receptors. So P11 is also important in, in modulating uh, activity of MGLUR5 receptors and also in mediating antidepressant effects of MGLUR5 antagonists. And uh, this is something, of course, very interesting in, in relation to now um, the um, evidence and also the, I mean, clinical approval of ketamine, the glutamatergic antidepressant therapy. So we are working in this direction to understand more on how P11 can be important in, in modulating um, effects of, of um, MGLUR5 and also of the glutamate system. Uh, and it may also explain a little bit why the phenotype of the P11 knockout mice and, and the when we give this viral uh, overexpression to knock down P11 is so, so prominent. We get a very, very strong phenotype. It may be due partly to the modulation of the serotonin system, but also probably to uh, modulation of the glutamate system. One thing that has been, then been very interesting uh, to us also is to understand how uh, P11 is upregulated. What are these factors that upregulate P11. And one factor that seems definitely to be involved is uh, BDNF. So in uh, experiments with BDNF knockout mice and BDNF overexpression mice, we found regulation of P11. So in mice that have lowered level of um, BDNF in, in cortex and in putamen, we have lowered levels of P11 both at the mRNA and at the protein level. And vice versa, in mice with higher level of um, BDNF in cortex, we have increased uh, levels of P11 in cortex and in uh, higher levels of mRNA P11 in cortex and also at the protein level. So BDNF is a potent factor in regulating P11. Another factor that turned out to be very potent in regulating P11 is actually levodopa. And that turns me now more into Parkinson. So now, from now on, it, my lecture will be more focused on, on, on Parkinson's disease. And um, we found in this so-called Ungerstedt model of uh, dopamine denervation, where you give uh, six oxydopamine to, to completely uh, de denervate the dopamine system in, in one hemisphere. You can see it here by measuring Th protein that you get almost a complete uh, abolishment of the dopamine system. We found that in such animals, when we treated them chronically with levodopa, that we get a very prominent upregulation of P11 at both the message and also at the protein level. Uh, more recently, we have also again, uh, coming back to the fact that I'm a medical doctor, uh, extended this work to uh, tissue from um, patients with Parkinson's disease and here we found that P11 is actually reduced. So there is a, there is a regulation of P11 also in postmortem human tissue from PD patients. It's pr strongly reduced in uh, substantia nigra, in, in cortex, and also to some extent in putema. And a colleague of mine uh, did um, single cell RNA sequencing on dopamine neurons from uh, uh, control patients and Parkinson patients, and he found uh, at the mRNA level that in those dopaminergic neurons that are still present after a life of Parkinson's disease, uh, the levels of P11 are very, very strongly reduced, as you can see here. So there is definitely a regulation of P11 also in the dopamine system. One thing that we have done is that we have then uh, developed an assay to measure P11 in blood cells. And uh, <clears throat> we have um, used facts and been able to show that there is very abundant levels of P11 in monocytes, in uh, certain types of T cells, especially the, these uh, cytotoxic CD8 positive T cells, and in NK cells. So we have a very high and specific uh, fax signal for P11 in these cell types. And when we then studied um, blood cells from patients with Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's disease and depression, we saw that um, P11 is increased in um, 
Parkinson's disease patients, especially those ones with depression. But also there is an increase in T cells. And when we correlated the um, levels of P11 with uh, symptoms uh, from rating scales, we found a nice correlation between uh, the levels of P11 in monocytes and um, Parkinsonian uh, symptomatology. And we also found uh, a correla significant correlation in NK cells and in, in T cells. When it came to depression in this study, we found a correlation between P11 and the MADRA score in NK cells. And this is work that we try to refine and, and to do uh, understand more what's going on. And here uh, a colleague, a Serbian colleague, uh, Dejan uh, Mamula, is doing uh, now more detailed work on especially T cells to understand what is the role for P11 in T cells. And the idea being that this could perhaps have some uh, type of uh, biomarker value at the end. One other observation that we did, actually for the first time, it was a little bit surprising that it had not been published before, but when we studied P11 and we f in this Parkinson model, the Ungerstedt uh, 6 oxydopamine model, and found that P11 is very, very strongly upregulated upon L-dopa treatment, we also found that the 5 h one b receptor is actually very, I mean, uh, significantly upregulated. So both the 5 h one b and P11 system, so to say, is upregulated upon repeated L-DOPA treatment in, in this model. And the upregulation of 5 h one b receptors was seen both at the message level, but also at the, the protein level, uh, especially in substantia nigra, partiaticulata, and to some extent also in external level uh, part of uh, globus pallidus. Our findings were a few years um, later also extended to monkeys. So 5 h one b receptors are upregulated by levodopa in uh, in, um, in the dopamine depleted state. Then. So we then uh, also studied the effect of 5 h one b receptors on levodopa behavior responses. And uh, we came back to the um, wild type and, and P11 knockout mice. And what we observed was that um, when we gave repeated levodopa, and um, that's something that a lot of people find, we develop a sensitization. So you have more. In this case, we look at we lesion in one hemisphere and we look at how the animals rotate. And we see that they, there is an increased sensitization as expected by levodopa in the wild type animals. Actually, this is something that we didn't see in the knockout animals, but I, I will not go into that so much here, but it's an interesting observation. What we focused on in this study was the interaction between levodopa and 5 one b receptors. So what we did was that once we had treated animals with levodopa for a week and knowing that P11 and 5 h one b receptors are increased, we gave the animals also combined treatment with the 5 h one b agonist and could see that we could counteract uh, the levodopa response. And then we for another week and then we went back and gave only levodopa again and the animals rotated more. So the 5 h one b receptors seemed to dampen uh, the levodopa supersensitivity in, in, in this uh, rotation model. Uh, another model that we studied relates to side effects of uh, levodopa, the dyskinetic component of, of levodopa. We call it abnormal involuntary movements in, in animals. So you have rating scales to look at the side effect of levodopa in animals. And again, uh, the animals um, developed the side effect upon repeated levodopa therapy and that effect was somewhat smaller and significantly smaller in the P11 knockout animals. So we did this work and I actually presented this work in Lund. Uh, some of you, if you work in the Parkinson field, knows that Lund has a quite prominent uh, um, status in, in, in the Parkinson field, uh, even at the world stage. And uh, they uh, got very excited because they had found very similar and much more dramatic, I would say, data than me. So they found in a rat model of uh, levodopa-induced dyskinesias that the same drug that I had used, the CP94293, uh, actually contracted um, uh, abnormal involuntary movements very, very potently at um, 
uh, a little bit higher dose. They had also, in the same paper, uh, study found that the 5 g one a agonist could also reduce levodopa induced dyskinesias. And especially when you combined the 5 g one a and the 5 g one b uh, agonist, you had a very, very strong antidyskinetic effect. And they found a very strong antidyskinetic effect. They also uh, came up with uh, one idea, and this is something I can discuss a lot about because I think there are many mechanisms involved here, but one mechanism that, that they um, emphasized on was this, that um, when uh, there is um, a lesion of the dopamine system, um, you get a, a lot of uh, levodopa taken up by serotonergic neurons instead of dopaminergic neurons in the stratum. And the problem with that, when you take up uh, levodopa in serotonergic neurons, uh, is that um, the levodopa is decarboxylated into dopamine and being released. But this happens in a very uncontrolled fashion. So uh, when you release dopamine in the normal way, you have the dopamine transporter that takes up excessive dopamine, and you have the D2 receptor that can uh, Contract, I mean, acts as an autoreceptor and dampen further release. But those mechanisms are absent in a serotonergic terminal. So you get this very uh, excessive, uncontrolled uh, release of dopamine. And when you then, by treating the animals with the 5 h one a agonist, reduces the activity of the serotonin neurons, or with the 5 h one b agonist, reduces the release cap capability from the serotonin neurons, you can control this um, re release mechanism of false dopamine from serotonergic neurons. So this is the model that they propose. And I think it holds uh, definitely some truth, although I think it can be more mechanisms involved. But um, this model is also relevant to the clinical condition because we know in Parkinson's disease, and these are PET images that we have done at Karolinsky Institute on patients that I follow, so I work as a neurologist um, uh, along the side that I, I do the laboratory work. And already in, in early Parkinson's disease, hernan jahr stage one, we have a very prominent loss of, of, in this case, the dopamine transporter, especially here at the terminal level. So we have the cell bodies and we have the terminals. Uh, but we have this prominent uh, reduction of the dopamine transporter in putamen very early on in Parkinson's disease. Whereas the serotonin system seems to not be very much affected. So I think quite a lot of the levodopa that we give to the patients uh, actually end up in serotonergic neurons and they are decarboxylated there and released in this uncontrolled fashion. And I can show you an example from the clinics how this looks like uh, with the levodopa induced dyskinesia and, and how a patient in a little bit more advanced stage can then fluctuate from being what we call off to, to on this kinetic. So these are films of the same patient uh, when she comes to the clinic in, without uh, having taken her morning medication. So let's see now if it, perhaps I should turn off. Um, so uh, so she, here she is without any Parkinsonian medication. So she's very, very slow in her movements. Have problems to initiate walking and she has, you can see on her um, arm swings that they are very, very reduced and she walks with very, very, her gait is very, very um, affected and um, you see the doctor is almost afraid that she would fall. And when she turns, she tends to freeze in the ground. So this is it, the way it looks like when a Parkinson patient is advanced, I would say, Parkinson patient is off levodopa medication. So a very severe hypokinesia. And then the same, very same patient get her levodopa uh, treatment and then uh, is filmed half an hour, something like that, half an hour after her uh, treatment, and then the very same patients looks like this. So this is what we then call levodopa-induced dyskinesia. So you have this inv involuntary uh, movements in the head and in, in the extremities. 
But it's a little bit complicated as a clinician because at the same time she also has a beneficial uh, therapeutic effect of levodopa. So you see she walks much, much better. She has a little bit very typically this way of moving her hands that is very typical from when you have this dyskinetic response. But she walks, as you can see, very much better. So she has a therapeutic response to levodopa, but also this dyskinetic side effect. And this is very common uh, among uh, around 50% of our patients with Parkinson's disease develop this dyskinesia uh, five to uh, eight years um, after treatment. So anyway, based on this is what I find inspiring myself, being a medical doctor and also running a lab, uh, is that I have the capability of trying to introduce the novel treatments also into the clinic. And together with uh, Anders Björklund in Lund, uh, we looked for various possible compounds that we could test them, the hypothesis that this 5-HG1A, 5-HG1B, especially interesting for me then, uh, com combined treatment could contract uh, dyskinesia also in patients. So we looked for various compounds and we came up then with one compound called l -topracin. So l is... Um, a combined 5-HG1A, 5-HG1B uh, partial agonist. And it has actually been uh, studied uh, in several quite large uh, studies more for uh, against um, aggression uh, in uh, both schizophrenic patients and in patients with mental retardation. So uh, there is a lot of, and some very high profile papers in journals like Lancet uh, about with this eltoprasin for this indication, but, and I, to be honest, don't know why it was never pursued more. It was developed by Solvay, a Belgi Belgium uh, pharmaceutical company that does, does not exist anymore. And at the time when we started to work with this eltoprasin, uh, the compound was owned by a company called Psychogenics. But anyway, uh, a lot of this background uh, knowledge that you want to know about the compound uh, already existed when, when we had this idea of testing it against dyskinesia and Parkinson patients. So um, we did uh, a trial then in Stockholm and Lund uh, and we gave uh, this eltoprasin in a double blind randomized placebo controlled fashion and we used several different doses of eltoprasin to try to treat uh, this L-dopa induced dyskinesias. So the patients uh, came to us on a weekly basis. At the first occasion, they got uh, then levodopa, and we actually gave them 150% of the normal levodopa dose in order to be sure that they developed this dyskinesia. It was a little bit. Uh, um, yeah, it felt a little bit uh, stressful, uh, especially for the patients and to some extent for us, because the patient felt quite bad when they got uh, this uh, quite um, pronounced dyskinesia in some cases. But at the same time, for you, those of you who follow patients uh, know that the, unfortunately dyskine dyskinesia and, and like other symptoms can vary quite a lot from day to day. So in order to be sure that the patients really were dyskinetic when we tried them, we gave them 150% uh, of the levodopa dose. And in the first uh, uh, occasion or session, we gave them also placebo. But then there were four sessions where we were uh, blinded and they got three different doses of eltoprasin or placebo at one more occasion. And we included at the end uh, 22 patients, but, uh, and, but there were some patients that couldn't uh, do the full uh, trial. And uh, our primary objective was then to uh, assess the antidyskinetic effect of eltoprasin using two different rating scales, and especially this clinical dyskinesia rating scale, but also to look at the antiparkinsonian effect using this uh, standard assessment that we do called UPDRS. And then we also looked at, um, here is the second dyskinesia scale that I mentioned, but also at um, psychiatric uh, effects of eltoprasin. And we did this trial uh, in, in the, at our local clinic and uh, the results are actually very nice. 
So we found that deltoprasin at two different doses, both 5 mg and 7.5 mg, can counteract uh, L-DOPA induced dyskinesia compared to the randomized placebo. And this was seen both with both the rating scales that we used. And um, we had no significant effect of l on the anti-Parkinsonian action of levodopa. Because, of course, you don't want to give a treatment that makes the patients much more um, bradykinetic and, uh, and rigid. Uh, but uh, l toprasin had no effect on the anti-Parkinsonian action of levodopa, but then contracted uh, L-DOPA-induced dyskinesia. So we are very pleased with these results. And when it came to different adverse events, there were some more adverse events with the higher doses of l compared to placebo, but these were, in a way, expected um, adverse events such as nausea and vomiting. And we know that the serotonin system is inducing this type of side effects, uh, but that in these previous studies that I mentioned, that were, they have studied uh, aggression and, and um, in, the, in the mentally retarded uh, patients and so on, these uh, effects, these serotonergic side effects had gone away upon repeated dosing. So, so I, I, we are not too worried about these side effects. And what was very good for us is that the psychiatric side effects were not that prominent. So we, we uh, think that also uh, l is uh, safe and well-tolerated uh, therapy in, in uh, this uh, population of patients. We also did pharmacokinetic studies and measured uh, L-toprasin in plasma uh, from the patients at the different doses. And it turns out then that um, the Tmax of L-toprasin is 2.2 hours, and it's uh, also a dose-dependent um, pharmacokinetic profile. And, uh, it's actually quite nice uh, with the uh, Tmax after two hours because it resembles quite a lot the Tmax that you get of levodopa. So we can imagine that you can combine this treatment in the future, that you can give el toprasin perhaps a little bit before levodopa or at the same time as levodopa. We gave it at the same time as levodopa in our trial. So we think that this is, this is uh, we are very uh, yeah, interested in pursuing with this. It has turned out to be a little bit difficult now to get funding and to get also the pharmaceutical companies interested in doing um, a treatment, uh, a, a repeated treatment, a chronic treatment with letopracin. But we, we are still working on trying to get that done because we think this mechanism is something that is still unexplored and that can really help the patients. So to summarize this first part of my talk, uh, I've said that P11 is an ad important adapter protein to 5 h one b receptors and also 5 h 4 and mgra 5 that I haven't had time to talk about, uh, but, and also actually to some ion channels. Um, P11 is upregulated by antidepressants but reduced in depression. P11 knockout mice have a depression-like phenotype and respond less to antidepressants. SSRIs, uh, exert antidepressant actions in this novel suppressed feeding test uh, via a 5 h one b or 5 h one 4 perhaps, uh, uh, P11, and XNA2, um, small CA3 signaling pathway. P11 is very strongly upregulated by BDNF and levodopa, but reduced in Parkinson's disease. Uh, 5 h one b receptor agonism uh, reduces l dopa induced dyskinesia. It's something that we found, and they found in Lund also, and we went then together and did this clinical trial with letopracin that actually contracts uh, levodopa-induced dyskinesias without uh, compromising the anti-Parkinsonian effect of levodopa. So, uh, yeah, so this is the, the, the first part of my talk, and I'm, I'm, I uh, now move on to a shorter uh, part uh, that relates to li even a little bit more recent work that we, we have done. The P11 work, by the way, moves on, so we continue to work a lot on P11 in the lab. If someone has interest in, in, in joining my lab or come and visit or collaborate on that, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to do that. So, But we are also working on other things. So one thing is... Um, uh, a re another receptor called GPR37. Uh, so if you really uh, want to help the Parkinson patients, I mean, these new anti-dyskinetic uh, therapies or perhaps uh, 
um, treatments that uh, prevents, I mean, dementia and so on are, 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 are very good, of course. Uh, but we're, what we really need to have uh, for these population of patients is something that slows down the disease progression or even better regenerate the dopamine system or the, or the, or the uh, circuitries that are affected by Parkinson's disease uh, because we are lacking that. And when it comes to the progression of uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, alpha-synuclein and Lewy bodies uh, plays the critical role. And there is a very interesting um, correlation between the spread of alpha-synuclein um, determined by, by neuropathologies such as Heiko Brack and the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And this is illustrated in, in this cartoon here. So here you can see in a surgical human brain section how, PLA, uh, how uh, alpha-synuclein or Lewy new white Lewy bodies are being detected in the brain of the patients and symptoms. So we have first in Parkinson's disease a preclinical phase where the patients lose olfaction, they get depressed, and they also have uh, REM sleep behavioral disorder not indicated here. And in this early preclinical phase of Parkinson's disease, you find uh, Lewy bodies. In the brain stem, you find it in the olfactory bulb and also in the gastrointestinal tract. Then there is a spread of the alpha-synuclein and it engages the dopamine neurons and the patients develop uh, the movement disorder with um, bradykinesia, uh, rest tremor and rigidity. And they get their diagnosis, so that's why it says time zero. But then the disease progresses and the alpha-synuclein engages, I mean, large part of the brain, including the whole, I'm oh, sorry, now I'm pointing myself, but I <laughs> um, engages uh, the ho whole uh, part of the, of the brain, including uh, cortical regions, and a lot of the patients develop hallucinations and dementia. So 80% of our Parkinson patients eventually develop dementia. And also these motor complications that I just talked about, the dyskinesia and wearing off. And uh, again, the lower bodies are uh, then the, um, something that propagates in the brains and correlates nicely with this um, uh, progression of the phenomenology of Parkinson's disease. But the, and the main component of lower bodies is alpha synuclein, but there are other components such as ubiquitin and then this GPR37 that we have been interested in. So uh, GPR37 is a part then of the, of the Lewy bodies. And if you overexpress uh, GPR37, it's also called PAL-R. This, uh, this receptor has two names. Uh, but if you overexpress this uh, GPR37 by viral uh, transduction in um, Substantia nigra, and you uh, get um, a reduction, a strong reduction of uh, dopamine cells, both at the level of the cell bodies and at the level of the terminus as illustrated here. Here you can see the overexpression of, of uh, GPR37 and here you can see how TH is uh, downregulated. So uh, <coughs> GPR37 seems to be involved in the pathology of Parkinson's disease. And based on these studies, uh, we have been interested to, to study GPR37 and we started off with a very simple uh, cellular model, M2A cells that are dopaminergic or catecholaminergic cells that respond to various Parkinsonian toxins. And we overexpressed uh, GPR37 fused with GFP to these cells. And, and it looked like, uh, like this. And we then measured uh, various um, uh, markers for neuronal variability in the cells, but they were quite fine. So we were yeah, a little bit surprised given the literature and so on. Uh, but then the student and we discussed and so on, we decided to perhaps try to, because if you can differentiate these cells, they get a little bit more neuronal-like and they get, neuronal, they get branches and they get um, um, dendrite-like structures and so on. So we differentiated the cells. And what happened then was that quite a lot of the GPR37 actually went out to the cell surface, as you can see here, compared to in the undifferentiated cell. And to our large surprise, uh, in this differentiated state, 
when we then exposed the cells to different um, Parkinsonian toxins, such as 6-oxydopamine that I mentioned before is a very potent toxin to kill dopamine neurons. The cells that had GPA 37 but then at the cell surface, were actually protected uh, or had a protective mechanism against the 6 oxydopamine induced neurotoxicity. So we came up with this model where we think that, and that's also something that I describe in all these different, very also prominent articles, uh, that GPR37 is a, a receptor that is very easily misfolded. So when it's not properly folded, it tends to then also, together with proteins like alpha synuclein and so on, end up in, in lower bodies. So, uh, and there is one other paper uh, where they actually use uh, also GPR37 via this mechanism. It's known to be so easily misfolded to, to uh, um, cause um, neuronal degeneration. Whereas if it is properly folded, uh, and transported out to the cell surface, it actually can exert neuroprotection. And we summarized this uh, data that we had on both neurodegeneration and neuroprotection in relation to Parkinson's disease in a paper in TIPS not so long time ago, and where we write very much about, so if you want to read more about this receptor and its role in Parkinson's disease, we, we describe in detail on how uh, GPR37 is involved in, in um, mechanisms related to ubiquitination, uh, related to um, also the um, unfolded protein response and also to uh, lysosoma degradation, but also how properly folded GPR37 can go out to the cell surface and exert neuroprotection. So we made that finding, we published it, that it goes out to the cell surface and exert neuroprotection, and then we were very excited because another group <coughs> led by Randy Hall in um, United States uh, claimed that they had found um, endogenous ligand for GPR37, because I should have said that from the beginning perhaps, but GPR37 is an orphan receptor. It's not known uh, what is the native ligand, but then uh, in 2013, uh, Randy Hall reported that they had found the native ligand for uh, GPR37, and it turned out to be actually neuroprotective factors Supposing C and prosupposing. Prosupposing is then the pro hormone for supposing C. So prosupposing is actually divided into four different supposings, but supposing C then specifically bound to GPR37. And since we have some technologies at uh, Karolinska to track single uh, receptors and molecules, we apply them to, to, to this uh, data by Randy Hall. So we used our uh, cell line with GPR37 fused with GFP and put supposing C, uh, rhodamine labeled supposing C on the cells. And we found um, that uh, supposing C is to some extent uh, bound and co localized with GPR37. But what we did more and what was the real purpose of this experiment is that we used a technique called fluorescent cross correlation spectroscopy which is a very sophisticated experiment to follow single mo fluorescent molecules. So what you do is that you, you put the laser beams on a, a very, very small part of the membrane, and then within, and when molecules then pass through this uh, small um, component where they have the laser beam, you get the fluorescent curves. And then you look at the correlation between these curves, then a green channel and red channel, and you can see then if there is what we call a cross-correlation between a red and a green molecule going through this uh, small compartment of the uh, laser beam. And we could indeed see a cross-correlation between supposing C and GPR37, indicating that at least as a complex, they can move together at the um, cell surface. So we could add then supposing C as... as uh, uh, probably uh, something that could exert a neuroprotective effect uh, via GPR37. Uh, <coughs> supposing C also has an important uh, function in, uh, in lysosomes, but that's, that's a little bit of another story, but which we also follow and find interesting. 
Now I should say that the, the whole uh, area here with supposing C and prosupposing uh, is a little bit controversial. It has been replicated, this da data, in some papers, but there is also one or two papers that have not been able to replicate uh, this finding. And uh, it seems to ha be a little bit dependent upon the, the, the cellular uh, composition. So it tends to work better actually in, in more complex cells than in, in more simple cells like hex cells and cos cells. Although Randy Hall initially did his work in hex cells. But, but anyway, still, GPR 37 at the cell surface is something that we think uh, to transport away GPR 37 from this intracellular component and getting it to the cell surface is something that we think can exert neuroprotection. And based on this um, data, we developed, or a postdoc in my lab um, developed an assay to uh, follow uh, in a very multiplexed way uh, this GFP fused GPR 37 in cells. So she, she used uh, a very, I mean, high content uh, imaging assay. She developed that, a microscope based assay to track. Uh, GPO 37 in the cells. And she had uh, also developed a, a way uh, to measure uh, GPO 37 specifically at the cell surface. Uh, and she had some positive controls that we know increased uh, GPO 37 at the cell surface. It could show that she could really, she can really distinguish between. Um, GPR 37 at the cell surface versus the, the complete um, cell. In a way that people, we did this together with a facility in chemical biology and they were very satisfied with all these uh, control experiments and so on. So what we have done, and all this is still unpublished data, is that we have now started to screen for compounds that can increase uh, GPR 37 at the cell surface. And in the first screen of compounds, we used what is called the Prestwick library. And the Prestwick library is a library of compounds that are already used in the clinics. So they're used for different types of indi indications. But as you can see uh, in green here, we have a few hits, not that many. And I think people who do this type of screens consider that good. Because if you get too many hits, I mean, it's, uh, there's a risk that there's a lot of non-specific uh, effects and, and it's also a lot to, to, to verify, but we have a few hits. Um, so we are very excited about this. Uh, so we have a few already known clinical compounds that increase GPR 37 at the cell surface. And especially one of these hits, we have them moved on, or uh, Lina Leinart uh, did this. Um, she moved on and she did, uh, as you can see here, a very complete uh, dose response. And you can also see by just looking at uh, the intensity of the signal and also she measured down the intensity at the cell surface that uh, this compound really really increases uh, GPO 37 especially down at the cell surface and she has also then used this compound and come back to this M to A assay where we look at uh, how cells respond to these Parkinsonian toxins and uh, she has found that this new compound that we um, has found um, is called compound A here. So, so, so we have a positive control that we know increases. This is actually uh, cyclic AMP analogs and also a compound called PBA that are very pro can prominently uh, increase GPR 37 at the cell surface. They are the positive control. But she also found that this uh, compound A, so the compound that we found in the screen, uh, very, very potently uh, protect uh, these N to A cells towards the toxic effects of 6-oxydopamine. And, and there are doses here where the, um, the cells um, lacking um, GPO 37, I mean, have, have uh, no uh, uh, at all uh, viable uh, viability left in, in the presence of 6-oxydopamine, whereas these cells uh, that have the GPR 37 and are treated with the positive controller compound A are, are fairly protected. So we are now uh, trying to move this, and we have to some extent done that, move this type of data into to animal models to 
to see if we can protect also uh, animal models to uh, using these compounds towards, uh, for example, 6-oxydopamine, but also alpha synuclein. So to summarize the second part of uh, my talk, let's see now. Perhaps time is up. <laughs> it doesn't move now. Got the computer got locked here now, but um, I don't know. No, 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 it moved fast. <laughs> okay, uh, and I'm, so this is the summary of this part then. So GPR 37 is increased in brains of patients with Parkinson's disease and found in lower bodies. But our then cellular study suggests that the cellular localization of GPR 37 may determine whether this receptor is involved in neurodegeneration, like most people have published and think of GPR 37, or actually in neuroprotection, and where the saposin C may actually also then be, be part of that protective mechanism. And we believe then that the compounds that increase properly for the GPR 37 at the cell surface may be neuroprotective by reducing protein misfolding, relieving ER stress, or recruiting neurotrophic signaling such as this uh, saposin C. So before I finish, I'd like to, to emphasize that uh, some of these studies that I've been talking about have been done in collaboration with colleagues actually from uh, Serbia. So uh, Vesna Lazarevic, uh, who is now working in my lab, uh, is uh, for some years now, is a, a very, very, I mean, a good colleague in doing work, especially with primary neuronal cultures and, and very detailed work on, on uh, trafficking of um, uh, especially vesicles at the presynaptic site and her husband uh, Deja Mamula has, has joined the lab a little bit more recently and is now doing a lot of work on P11 uh, especially in, in, in relation to the immune cells and then uh, Georgia has been in the lab now I don't know if it's three times or uh, even more, perhaps four times, and, and, and has a very, very interesting data on, and I like the collaboration a lot, because you do a very unique and, and, and a very awesome and labor-intensive stress model here, and I recognize that, that there's a lot of work that you are doing here, and then you have been able to send the brains to Stockholm and done some very molecular work, and you have some very, very interesting data now on molecular mechanisms that underlie the stress vulnerability in, in, in this animal model that we now, hopefully later this year, can complete in, I think, a very good paper. Then the work that we did with this progression cross-correlation spectroscopy was done in close collaboration with Vladana Vokujevic. Vladana Vokujevic is uh, actually co-supervisor of, of several of my students. Then other... Uh, researchers that are doing very well in our uh, department and institution where, I, where I'm working is uh, Dr. Maya Gordic and also Dr. Lubika Matic. And I should also say that when I see patients at the clinics, I also work uh, sometimes with uh, Anna Radovic. So she should also probably have a photo here. We haven't done any research together, but we have seen patients together. And in my very last slide, I want to acknowledge also some people, other people that are not from Serbia, <laughs> but, but have also contributed a lot to the work that I have uh, uh, discussed. And we also have this spectacular photo from Karolinsky Institute where we have the um, two first buildings uh, of Karolinska that are more than 200 years old. And we have this now spectacular building that was actually built uh, 2010, where we have a lecture hall that uh, holds a uh, thousand people and where the Nobel uh, lectures give their, uh, Nobel uh, laureates give their Nobel lectures. So, so yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.